Hi, everybody. I'm just going to give a moment or two for participants to get logged on. Um, and while people are logging on, I'll begin with uh, a brief introduction of myself. Um, for those of you who maybe didn't see the first part of the webinar series, my name is Sheila Pluzzi. I have a private practice in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and I'm also a co-founder of The Healing Loft, which is a holistic wellness um, institute that we run here in Sault Ste. Marie. And I'm also a co-director of Mental Health Foundations. So as part of that role and that vision of Mental Health Foundations, we want to be able to offer as many free resources to individuals, couples, families uh, to provide support. So this webinar and uh, most of the webinars I do are absolutely free of charge. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to join you this evening. We're gonna be doing the part two for couples. Uh, so last webinar, we focused more on what creates disconnect in our relationships. And this evening, we're going to be focusing on how to increase connection. Um, so I'm gonna take a moment to share the screen so you can see. Um, and as I'm setting this up, I want to welcome any questions. So you will notice that in the middle, I think the bottom middle, you'll see a Q&A um, little box. You can type questions in at any time to myself in that box. And what I'm going to do is, instead of answering as I go, I'm going to take a few minutes at the end of our time together today and I'll answer the questions um, at the end. What I do want people to know, so you may be watching this with your partner, um, you may be wanting your partner to watch it another time, so it is being recorded, um, this session, only myself um, will be presented, so you'll, you will remain completely anonymous as a participant, uh, but we wanna be able to make these webinars available at any time for people. So if you wanna come back and review it, um, the, the video will be made available probably within a week at the www.mentalhealthfoundations, <clears throat> pardon me, .ca at that website, uh, and it'll be under the tab called Psychotherapy, um, and then you'll be able to access both videos. So again, if, if you didn't get to join the first part, um, you will be able to access the video if you want to go back and, and review it. Um, and I believe that's it. Like I said, feel free to, to ask questions as we go and I will address them at the end. Um, so tonight we are focusing on increasing connection for couples. And a brief review, I guess, of the agenda for this evening is I, I will do a quick review of the negative cycle um, because it is an important piece of learning how to, um, you know, once we can know where the disconnect is being created in our relationships, that gives us a bit of a template in terms of how to then build connection and increase connection. So I'll do a quick review of that, um, a review of triggers and their impact on our relationships. Uh, looking at how to manage our own triggers and then communicating um, our needs to our partner and as well as, sorry, I just noticed the typo, but a partner activity, not a partner activity. So a brief um, overview of the negative cycle. I'm not going to go as in depth as I did in the last webinar, but do invite you to go watch that video if any of this is confusing. Um, but essentially, when we are in a negative cycle in our relationships, and, and we all have negative cycle in our partner relationships, it creates disconnect. And if you see, you know, the, in, in the center of that image is uh, infinity symbol or an eight, and it works as a dynamic. So if I feel triggered um, in my relationship, I may act in a way, I may become really criticizing towards my partner. Um, and that behavior may trigger them. And often when we are coming from a triggered place, it's really difficult for us to be authentically communicating with our partners. Often we're more in like a defensive or attack kind of stance. And that's often when, you know, um, 
maybe disagreements explode. Uh, we say things we don't mean when we're triggered. So what we want to kind of look to understand is, you know, why we act the way we do, what our triggers are, um, what are the emotions connected to those trigger reactions, and what are the needs that are, are being unmet in those certain situations. And today we'll be going into that in much more depth um, so that, you know, we can go back to our partners so we can have disagreements um, that lead us or keep us connected, you know, as opposed to triggered and disconnected from our partners. So there's the link um, if you wanted to go to see the full video, I go into much more explanation in terms of what the negative cycle is. Um, but for you know, the sake of time this evening, I just gonna do a quick overview. This photo I really love um, and I wanna credit it to the Emotion Focused Family Therapy model. The reason why I like this visual is usually when we're triggered, um, we, what you're seeing on the surface, so if you look at in the sky, you'll see denial, avoidance, criticism, rejection, accommodating, enabling, blame, defensiveness. Those are usually the things that we see on the surface when we're triggered or when our partners are triggered. And sometimes, you know, when we stay on the surface and communicate those surface um, issues, we don't always get to what's lying underneath. And most often these are what we're actually feeling. We're either afraid, uh, there may be grief, helplessness, shame, self-blame, or hopelessness. So in order to get out of the negative cycle, we want to understand those you know, surface trigger behaviors, but we also want to understand what's going on for us and our partners at a deeper level um, so that we can have, again, those connective um, those connective and, and I guess just genuine kind of communication in terms of how we're feeling. So we did talk a little bit in the last webinar about triggers. Um, what are they? They are very intense emotional responses to certain situations. We all have different triggers. Some of us may be triggered by rejection. Some of us may be triggered by conflict or anger. And in the face of any kind of conflict, we may either become really defensive or we may freeze or we may just want to get the heck out of that situation. Um, but triggers are those really intense emotional responses that often lead to those behaviors, you know, that we saw in the last image of, you know, either criticism, rejection, denial, blame, defensiveness. Um, but they do come from um, patterns of, or hurts from the past. So if I have a trigger for rejection, um, I'll, I'll make something up, but you know, if I was maybe not, not feeling understood when I was younger and you know, made attempts to connect often with my parents, and for whatever reason, maybe they worked a lot or they were never home, um, but that I often felt rejected. Then when we grow up um, with a sensitivity to that, as we get in adult partnerships, when we experience rejection, it can be incredibly painful. So triggers are, you know, our behavior and how we react is not always helpful, but our triggers are very real and they're usually attached to something that we've experienced from the past that has been quite painful. So you'll see when we delve in a little bit more in terms of, um, you know, how to begin to manage them, we want to bring a ton of compassion to them because, you know, we didn't ask to be triggered by certain things. It just, it is how it you know, we have them for reasons and because things that have happened from the past. And in terms of how they impact our relationships, um, as I mentioned before, when we're triggered, it's an intense emotional response. And when we're in heightened emotion, it's harder for us to be logical or understanding of the other person's perspective or even just hear what the other person's saying. So when we're triggered and that intense emotional response is there, we usually tend to react as opposed to respond. So again, those reactions may be 
if I feel triggered by my partner, I might start blaming, right? Well, that wouldn't have happened or I wouldn't have done that if you wouldn't have um, said this in the first place or it's your fault and here's all the reasons why it's your fault. Um, so when we're reacting in those triggers, that's usually when it, it does tend to create disconnect. And it also, um, when we're reacting to our triggers, we don't tend to be grounded in an authentic response for ourselves either. Um, I'm 100% guilty of using criticism and blame, um, avoidance at times when I'm triggered and how I behave in those moments isn't really true to who I am. I, I don't like to make people feel bad and yet when I'm triggered, sometimes I'll criticize. Um, so we want to bring a ton of compassion to them, but also understand them so that when it happens, we will talk about ways to regulate so that we're not reacting. We'll talk about how to regulate the nervous system and that intense emotional response so that we can respond to our partners as opposed to react. So the four steps below um, are ways that we can begin to manage our triggers. So the first thing is to name it. Name it to tame it. When we can have an understanding of why we're having such an intense, an intense emotional response, that's a cornerstone. Knowledge is power. And once we can start to name what our triggers are, then we're going to be a bit more aware of when it happens. And it will also you know, help you to understand your, yourself in a bit of a deeper um, way. So the first one's name it to tame it. We'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, second is to regulate the nervous system. So as I mentioned, you know, when we're triggered, sometimes people say like it's just such a visceral response that they literally can't even hear what their partner's saying. They're in either, you know, fight, flight, freeze, they're, they're in their reaction um, and they're not, they're no longer able to, to truly communicate. So learning how to regulate our nervous system can help us to get to a place where we can respond as opposed to being in that triggered reactive place. Number three, ask yourself what you are truly needing from your partner in that moment. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, once we're regulated, how to start to identify what is it that I'm really needing? You know, do I, do I need my partner to agree with me or do I just need them to understand that rejection is really hard for me or that I need them to understand that um, in the face of conflict, I, I feel terrified and just want to run. Um, so we'll talk about how to begin to express, the, identify and then express those needs and then how to communicate that to our partner. So I'm going to take my time going through this because I want to invite each of you um, to reflect on these questions. Because we're not face-to-face -face, um, and having the, I can't read the nonverbals, so we don't have, you know, as much, but I do want to invite you um, to really reflect on these questions. So, you know, you can choose, you can close your eyes as I read these questions out loud, but after each one, um, I'm, I'm just going to leave a bit of empty space and some quiet space and invite you to just really go inward and think about, you know, what, what is true for yourself. When do you notice that you get triggered in interactions with your partner? So what circumstances um, or what patterns do you notice? Um, where you're getting really, really triggered. And then next, what is that experience like for you? And you can describe this um, in terms of how it feels, you know, emotionally, um, you can use, you know, a description like I feel unloved or I feel like my partner doesn't care. But just to really think about, you know, in those moments and situations when you're triggered, what is that like for you?
and then going a bit deeper, what is the emotion attached to that experience? You know, so if, you know, I get triggered when my partner um, criticizes me and that experience um, makes me feel like I'm not good enough or they don't appreciate me, the emotion to that may be shame, right? Not feeling good enough somehow, not worthy. So you can use, um, you know, the, the four emotions that I have listed are um, you know part of the primary emotions <clears throat> so if you can pick one that most closely fits um, what the experience is like for you then um, i would encourage that or if you have another word feel free to write that down as well and where for you could this trigger have come from and before I pause in silence, um, just want to acknowledge that, you know, we all have triggers. And even if we had, you know, wonderful childhoods uh, and great parents and felt loved, there, there still could have been patterns or there still could have been um, experiences in our past. And I, I say parents because it's usually from our primary Home environment that you know we develop some of these triggers and you know an example could be I had one client who was deeply triggered by anger in her partnership and the reason why was because in her parents relationship there was never outward any expression of anger so when her partner you know in real life when her partner would get mad at her to her it was it triggered in terms of she thought it was the end of the relationship because she never witnessed this and she thought anger was, was bad. And for her, it was a huge threat to the relationship. So we don't have to, some of us have, but we don't have to have experienced these deep, deep traumas um, to, to have triggers. So I just say that to normalize because um, sometimes, you know, people feel as though they needed to have really difficult childhoods um to have triggers and just want to normalize we all have them um, even if we had really loving parents um, so i just invite you to take a moment you know where do you think this pattern may have come from for you And so if there were any that you felt stuck on, I invite you absolutely, you know, to go back or once this video is up, you know, you can come back and watch it again and do some more reflection. Because part of being able to deeply connect with our partners requires us to, to, to connect with ourselves. And that can be a really difficult thing to do. So... I do encourage taking some time to really um, understand, you know, what each of your triggers are, um, what it feels like, when it happens, what the emotion is, and where that pattern came from from the past, in order again to develop an understanding of yourself and why you may respond or react in certain situations. Um, and and once we can kind of understand more clearly for ourselves. Not only does it help us you know, engage differently, but it also helps um, when it gets to the part of being able to communicate that to our partners, it can help them to understand why we react in certain ways as well. Um, so the, the other part of it that we'll talk a little bit about too is bringing compassion to ourselves in those moments. I had said, you know, triggers are, they're very real, they're very painful, they're very deeply emotional. And so my hope is that as I'm talking about triggers and having you identify your own, that there's not um, any feeling of judgment that you have towards yourself. 
Um, Because we want to bring compassion to our triggers so that we can help work through them and understand them. Um, And that it doesn't make you a bad person, um, doesn't make you weak uh, for getting triggered by certain things. They're not silly. Uh, We just want to be able to understand them so that we can attend to them and then also start to regulate when we are triggered. So... Part of what I teach all couples when I'm working with them is how to begin to regulate when, you know, they've noticed that they've been triggered. And our breath is probably the most efficient and powerful tool um, that can help regulate our nervous system. So I do want to clarify, self-regulation when we're triggered is not about shutting down or dismissing how we feel and the emotion behind it. Self-regulation is about being able to bring down the intensity of that trigger so that we can be in a place to respond as opposed to the react. So in terms of some of the most effective um, breathing techniques, uh, I did a bit of a consult with uh, my colleague who practices pranayama and yoga and she suggested just in terms of simplicity and effectiveness these two breaths and it may sound silly but i am going to review them simply because a lot of us um depending on your practices so i don't want to make assumptions some of you may use breathing all the time um but not everybody you know, has been encouraged to or has that a part of their self-care or anything like that. So I wanna really review it because often we're, we are very stressed and we don't take full deep breaths. So the cleansing breath, it is abdominal breathing. So on the inhale, it's gonna be through the nose and to inhale as deeply and slowly as possible so that not only your chest rises, But if you put your hand on your belly, that your lungs are so full that you can feel your your stomach start to push out. And on the exhale, it's through the mouth. And again, slowly and deeply. And I put a little note at the bottom that when we emphasize the exhale, excuse me, the parasympathetic nervous system slows. Heartbeat relaxes, circulation, nerves, digestive system. So I do encourage really, really focusing on drawing out that exhale. Because when we're triggered, you know, it's our sympathetic nervous system that is just, it is activated. And what we want to try to do is just to start to regulate that and to calm the nervous system, bring down the heart rate again, so that we can just create some space to be able to respond to those triggers or those moments when we're feeling triggered. And the other breath is called the relaxing breath. The true relaxing breath suggests inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. When I've practiced this at times with um, couples and individuals, sometimes they notice that that it's too much the seven and the eight, that it's like they just, they either start to feel a little lightheaded um, or it just feel like they're just incapable, you know, of drawing it out for that long. So you can start also, you can start with four, four, four. So inhale for four, hold, and then exhale through the mouth for four. And as you practice it, get familiar with it, to try to extend the hold and then extend the exhale as much as possible. Again, so that you can activate the parasympathetic nervous system to start calming the body. Um, And some people, you know, I'm working with couples, they'll be like, well, when are we supposed to do this? Because in the heat of the moment and when we're both triggered and we're going at it, um, and there's no one right way um one couple uh, i think i mentioned in the last webinar they had a really humorous way so what they would do is they would notice when they were in the negative cycle when they were triggered and communication was no longer helpful and one of them would throw in the white towel or wave the white flag that was their indication themselves that they needed to take a break 
but they also had the agreement that after some you know time to calm down they would come back and reinitiate whatever conversation they were having so again there's no perfect way but sometimes it's being able to call a time out you know and just being able to say hold on i'm triggered anything i say beyond this is not going to be helpful or connecting uh, i need to i need to go take a moment and you know that's when you can initiate and practice some of the self-regulation and then once it gets a bit more familiar you may be able to just you know simply take one deep breath if your partner's saying something that you're finding triggering um, you can kind of do it within the conversation just to help keep you regulated and present whew, and out of a trigger but again it's a process and a practice so I also realize, you know, in a one hour webinar, I'm throwing a bunch of information um, at you, but also want to, to normalize that this is, you know, new for a lot of people. And it's also um, a process. So to just, you know, kind of practice with it and, and um, do encourage if possible to stay with it, though, but to not have these expectations of like, next time I'm triggered, I need to manage it perfectly and not react and respond in this really calm way. <laughs> so to give yourself some room for mistakes, because um, again, it's a process. And when, when we're talking about our partnerships, those are like the most powerful and important relationships, one of, um, in our adult life. And so, you know, when we're so invested in somebody, we love somebody so much, um, it's, it's hard to stay completely grounded and logical and, and, uh, and not get triggered, um, especially because we're just, we're so emotionally invested. So the breath is a very, very powerful tool in terms of self-regulating. Another one that, um, I've used like with myself and also with couples is if you notice, you know, that you've been triggered, this one uses the breath, but it also includes a mantra. So bringing a phrase and focus with compassion in terms of our trigger responses can help us to soothe the emotion and eventually create space also to understand our partner's point of view. Um, and then self-compassion, I just said a very quick description, but it's the unconditional love of ourselves, especially in moments of struggle. Uh, and the more self-compassion we practice, the more compassion we'll, we'll also be able to provide for our partners. So when you recognize, or if you, know, you recognize that you've been triggered, um, it, it, like I said, it's an emotionally painful experience. So if you're taking some time out or say a conversation didn't go well and you're just feeling really triggered um, or hurt or upset by, you know, what transpired in that conversation, this one you can put your hands on your heart. And you don't have to use the example I'm going to give. You can pick your own. But the idea is connecting to your heart because that's usually where it hurts. Um, and to start taking a few deep breaths. Again, to start calming the parasympathetic nervous system. And then you can repeat as many times as you need to. You know, this is a painful trigger for me. And it's really difficult for me to communicate what I need when I feel this way. Or you can keep it as simple as this hurts. This hurts. And continue to breathe until you feel, again, not the emotion pass, but until you feel the intensity of it start to settle a little bit. And the idea of, the reason why emphasis self-compassion when we're triggered is for some of us, or you know, for some people, um, when they're triggered, they tend to they can tend to go to a really, um, you know, like I'm not good enough and I'm never going to be loved and he or she doesn't even care about me and I'm never going to find somebody to care about me and because I'm not worth it. So we can have a tendency to go into this really negative um, self-narrative. So the compassion is a way to tend to how we're feeling in a loving and accepting way. Um, 
And again, I invite you to create your own mantra, uh, but just that idea of attending to how you feel, using the breath, and bringing some kindness and compassion to how you're feeling in that moment. So a big part of um, being able to connect with our partners is being able to ask for what we need. Because uh, sometimes, again, when we're in the negative cycle or when we're triggered, um, sometimes we lose sight of even what we're needing emotionally. And it, it kind of just becomes, you know, more of a who's going to be right or who gets the final say. And, you know, if you remember that tree metaphor, most of the time what we're arguing about on the surface isn't genuinely going to get our needs met. We've got to go a bit deeper um, and be able to communicate what we're really needing in order to feel that connection. So to help you figure out what you're needing in certain situations, I just have the primary emotions listed and the actual need for each emotion. So I won't go into a huge explanation, but with emotions, they let us know that there's something going on in the environment for us to pay attention to. And every emotion has a specific need. And when that needs met, it allows for the emotion to be processed through. So we don't have to stop it. We don't have to pretend it's not there. We don't have to avoid it. We don't have to put a silver lining over it and pretend like everything's fine. Um, when the need is met, it allows us to help to process through it. So if your partner um, it just criticized you and called you something really mean, your response may be anger. Anger needs a boundary. And that can look different um, depending on you know, your relationship, depending on you know, what feels right for a boundary for you. But a boundary can be very concrete. It can be, uh, I, it is not okay to call me names ever or for us to call each other names ever. And next time you call me a name, I'm walking away. So it can be a very concrete boundary, um, but that's what anger needs. And for females, we tend to struggle sometimes with expressing anger, um, healthy anger anyway. And just, I mentioned that to bring, um, so you bring a bit of compassion to it. So often when we're angry, we might tend to do more of those passive little jabs. Uh, oh, it must be nice, you know, to have all that time to yourself or to be out in the garage all evening while I'm taking care of the children inside. Um, that, that's actually anger coming up. So the need for anger is a boundary. The need for fear. So fear is an actual, um, is in response to an actual threat. Um, you know, potentially the, I mean, with abuse, I, sorry, I don't I want, I don't want to encourage, um, that being safe at all in terms of our partnerships. But people do also experience real fear in terms of they feel like the relationship's being threatened, right? So um, if after an argument, you know, your partner leaves the house, that might trigger a real fear in terms of, holy moly, like, is he or she coming back? Are we done? Are we through? Uh, so the need for fear is protection. Um, shame. Shame is somehow we're not feeling worthy. The need for shame is reassurance. And um, this is a really powerful one I've seen be helpful in, in partnerships and couples. Um, is each person being able to express, you know, when they're feeling ashamed and being able to get that reassurance from the other person can be deeply connecting. Um, and then sadness is a response to any loss. So often um, I'll see sadness a lot in couples uh, because they're feeling a loss of connection. So it doesn't have to be you know, uh, as big as a, a death. Um, we can feel deep sadness if we're not feeling as connected to our partners as either we once were or whatever it might be. So sadness is um, response to a loss and the need for sadness is comfort. For some, that might be just as simple as a hug. Uh, it might be, um, you know, comfort with words, uh, whatever, you know, it can look different for other people, but the need for sadness is comfort. 
and enjoy. Um, you know, nothing feels better than when we can share something uh, that we're really excited about. So, you know, if I go to um, my husband and share something that's just so excited, I'm feeling so joyful about um, my need is that celebration for him to like connect and, and acknowledge, right? And kind of celebrate that joy. Uh, and if I don't get that response, I might get triggered and feel dismissed or rejected or unimportant. Um, but the need for joy is celebration. So once you can determine the emotion, right, that's connected to your, your trigger, it can help guide you to what you need. So if you notice that you're triggered by, um, say, your partner uh, walking away from the middle of an argument, you know, to look at, okay, how does that make me feel? And one little side note I'll put, sometimes the, the initial reaction is anger, especially if we've felt disconnected from our partners for a while. Sometimes like our reaction consistently is just pissed off, pardon my language. Um, so some, it might require kind of digging deeper. Um, so when my partner walks away, my initial response may be anger. Um, what is actually more powerful though, uh, would be the sadness for me anyway, right? Or possibly shame, right? But it's more of that, um, feeling that loss of connection or feeling unimportant or the shame might be connected, like I just don't feel good enough or valued or loved. Um, so once again, once you can kind of determine what the emotion is, it can help us to decide what we're needing. And the next step, which is, can be very, very vulnerable. So again, I know I'm just I'm presenting this as bullet points of, of information, um, but communicating something that is very vulnerable can be difficult. Um, one, some people are you know, afraid of, it's been a reality for some people that your partner won't understand or that they won't show compassion for it. So I get um, that I'm gonna kind of explain it in a simple way, but I do get that it, it's a very, very, can be a very, very vulnerable experience. Uh, but once you have an understanding of what your triggers are and why, I do encourage to let your partner know. It has been a really, really, really profound exercise when, you know, I've done it in my office with couples. Because um, once they have an understanding of one another and why, you know, those certain frustrating, like, reactions or triggers are happening, it just, you can just sense the shift in the room. And instead of feeling, you know, maybe guarded or protective or defensive, you can just sense a softening, you know, and, and, and more compassion for the other person. So I do encourage, as a vulnerable as it can be, to share, once you've identified and you're clear, to share what your triggers are and what it's like and, and where they come from. Um, and if you know what you need in those moments to communicate that as well. So the example I put, it's a bit wordy, but I wanted to make sure I hit all the points. So an example may be, I feel triggered and rejected. So the emotion of that would be shame. When you walk away from me during a disagreement, it is from part of my past when I would try to talk to my parents and they would dismiss me. And this, the next part is the need. When I feel this way, I need reassurance from you that you care about how I feel, even if you need to take a time out from the earth. So, the, I'm sorry, I just had a flashback of a couple um, that I was working with the other day, and the one thing that the, one of the partners felt was deep, deep shame for feeling as though um, they had disappointed their their partner, and that shame was so deep it it kept that person from engaging in any communication about emotions, um, and it kept that person really really drawn within themselves. And how their partner interpreted it was, "I don't care about you. 
I'm not interested in how you feel. Um, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with it. Uh, but once, you know, the partner shared how deeply ashamed they felt for feeling as though they were disappointing their partner and that that came from a painful experiences from their past, you could just, you could, you could feel the shift in the room, right? Because again, I'm not saying the other partner won't be triggered anymore when, you know, he shuts down, but there is just an, a deeper understanding, right? That me pulling within myself is not because I don't like you or I don't think you're important or I don't love you or I don't want to hear what you have to say. When I pull within myself, it's be, you know, because I'm trying to do protect myself, you know, from whatever, feeling more shame or I, I get paralyzed in terms of what to say because I just feel devastated by how I feel like I've disappointed you. Um, so we'll really, really encourage to be able to have a conversation with your partner. So if they're watching this webinar with you, um, it might be taking some time after this um, webinar to have that discussion. And if your partner's not watching with you, I mean, you could do a couple things, you know, invite them to watch this when it's a video. Um, or, you know, you can invite them to share. So you might go to them and share what your triggers are and, you know, ask them like, you know, when is it in, in our relationship that you get triggered by what I say or what I do? And what is that? And, you know, you can open up that dialogue um, so that both of you have a deeper understanding, um, not only for yourselves, but um, for, the, for the relationship and the connection. So sharing with our partners can help them to understand us more deeply and compassionately. Uh, give them some direction on how to support us when we're triggered and vice versa. And again, as I mentioned, you know, the, the couple that I just saw, it, and I've seen it with other couples, but the other day it was just so powerful. It almost brought tears to my eyes, but it, it can be such a deeply connecting experience. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not a conversation that couples have ever had. Um, sometimes we've been, you know, we can be married or together with someone for so, so long and have never had these conversations. And even for ourselves, we may not even know what our triggers are, um, but do invite you to explore and reflect on for yourself and then as well as sharing it with your partner. So this next activity um, I, I'm not going to lie, I struggled a little bit in terms of how to describe it because typically um, when I use this activity, I'm, I'm facilitating it within the context of a couple session. Um, and yet, I still wanted you to be able to have um, the breakdown of it if you wanted to try it with your partner. And it's been a really, again, it's been a really, really powerful tool for a couple of reasons. One, in terms of practicing, talking about how we're really feeling uh, with our partner. And two, um, to practice for both people. So this is a, a back and forth activity. But to practice um, really, really listening and, and trying to understand what our partner is trying to communicate. Pardon me. So it can be a bit tricky. Um, I'll go through the steps in a moment. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, can happen in this activity, so just to normalize it for you, and you might want to talk about having a timeout or a pause um, policy in there if it's not going well. But the idea is to communicate an authentic feeling. And often what happens, you know, when I'm doing it in session, is the other person wants to react, right, or explain or agree or disagree or you know give a reasons why and this activity is just about being able to reflect back what we're hearing our partners say and it's more than just the reflective listening when i've seen it unfold in session it, it can create space to be able to talk about how we feel because a lot of us um 
for various reasons, but a lot of us in our partnerships may be scared, you know, to say, uh, I'm really angry about this or I'm really hurt. Um, I feel, I feel, you know, sad when you'd rather be in the garage than be, you know, at home with me. Um, it's, not something that we're used to being able to, like, to, to communicate. Um, so by knowing, you know, and having a bit of reassurance that the, part, the other per person's only job is to simply reflect back what they hear us saying, sometimes it can help us, you know, have that courage to, to share emotions. Um, so how it works, I'm hoping this makes sense, but I, I, you know, I almost wish I had another person so I can show you how it would work. Person A begins with saying the other person's name. So I'm going to pretend my partner is Chris. Chris, I feel scared when we don't talk after an argument because my mind starts racing and I feel that maybe you're thinking of leaving um, and, and I, I, I go into a panic uh, when you walk away, you know, after an argument or in the middle of an argument. Okay, so that's number one. Partner B would respond with, Sheila, what I hear you saying is, you feel scared when? Now, there will be times when it's accurate and bang on. And in those cases, partner A, so Sheila, I would say yes, thank you. If I do not feel as though Chris is understanding me, when he's done reflecting back, you know, I can say, uh, no, Chris, what, what I'm trying to communicate is I feel scared that um, that our relationship is going to break down when you walk away from me in an argument or don't talk to me for days after an argument. So the the third part is you know a yes, thank you if the partner got it right, or it's an opportunity to clarify. Once you know you feel as though like if you're once you end with the yes, thank you. I just noticed I just says thank, sorry. Um, with the yes, thank you, then you switch. And this activity is not about resolving issues or problem solving or um, necessarily even getting to the root of something. This exercise is about creating some space and some time to be able to authentically communicate how each of you are feeling and also to have that experience to you know, feel understood, you know, as though your partner is genuinely hearing you. And if you notice, so some, you know, tips that might help if you choose to, to practice this. If your partner says something to you and you feel a trigger, right? Like if, I don't know, it's, I feel angry when you never do anything for me and you want to like, <gasps> I do this, this, this. So if you feel a trigger reaction, that's when you can bring in the breath. Take in that breath and to try to not react. So use the breath, take two if you have to, and then, you know, okay, so what I hear you saying is you feel angry because I don't do anything for you. Um, and I want to clarify to it doesn't mean you're agreeing, right? Reflecting back and, and understanding um, what our partners feel, it, it doesn't mean that you have to agree like, yeah, I never do anything for you. It's each of your experiences and perceptions um, and feelings are gonna be true for you. So it's not about deciding who's right or who's wrong or who gets to be angry about what or who gets to be sad about what or scared about what. It's just about being able to practice communicating those emotions um, and then communicating back and understanding. And this 
activity. Um, again, it's hard for it to go perfectly, and it is nice to have a facilitator at times, um, but it can be deeply, deeply connecting. Um, again, most of us weren't taught how to communicate how we feel. So in our adult relationships, um, you know, we, we might tend to get stuck in more of those surfacey, like functional conversations about like, where do the kids need to go and what do we need to get done today? And da, da, da. and we don't often have time or even the knowledge of how to communicate what we're feeling. And even when partners have shared some, I don't want to say intentionally hurtful, but some potentially hurtful things like, um, I feel, uh, I'm trying to think of one recently, but I feel uh, really sad when you put work in front of me, when I'm trying to talk to you and you're on your phone, it, it, it feels so sad. Even though that might hurt the other person to hear it, it can be so relieving to be able to speak the truth and how we're actually feeling in our relationships. Because for me, and I think in the research and the work that I do too, that's where we genuinely connect with one another is when we can be honest with where we're at, when we can bring compassion and you know, understanding, not always agreement, but compassion and understanding to where our partner's coming from. Um, that the moments when we feel um, understood are usually the moments when we feel most connected and you know I'm sure you've had experience like you don't always need to be right that sometimes it's fun <laughs> it feels good uh, but those aren't the moments when that create connection it's the moments when we're able to communicate an understanding for one another that really um, drive that deep deep connection and I you know I, I thought about for this webinar adding a whole bunch of different strategies, right? That couples can do, you know, some of them you already may be familiar with, like date nights and, um, you know, going out and doing new activities together and this and that. And those are amazing. I don't want to discount that. What I've noticed, um, you know, in the work that I've done with couples and just training that I've had is, you know, if, if I'm not feeling connected to my husband and we go out on a date night, I may not even know what the heck to say to him. Or we may end up talking about things that, you know, aren't, uh, I don't want to say not deep, because talking about kids and functioning and schedules, they're important. Um, but we might end up having more of those surface conversations and that is not necessarily going to change how I feel in terms of connection. So, I wanted to put more leverage into the self-reflection of understanding our own triggers uh, and also, you know, communicating it to our partner, understanding our partners, because when we can understand ourselves and each other at that deeper level, that's where the true connection comes in. And when we feel seen or heard or and loved by the other person, again, that's where we feel the most deeply connected. And then doing those other strategies, like having a date night, or you know, even just blocking time off to talk, um, they can be easier to do, or we're more likely to follow up with them if we're able to one, speak authentically, you know, in terms of how we're feeling and where we're at, and two, if we're feeling that connection. So I hope, um, I hope. What do I hope? I hope you're not disappointed <laughs> that um, I've mainly spent this time focusing on managing triggers, communicating triggers, understanding triggers. Um, Cause again, I, I do feel like that once we have that awareness and the ability to communicate that, that that's where we feel most connected in our relationships. Another strategy um, that you can use is you know, if you're triggered, if you notice you're triggered in a conversation with your partner, you can ask for clarification. Um, I know for myself, sometimes I get triggered when my perception, so I'm not saying this is what's being said, 
when my perception is I'm not doing enough, whether it's around the house or enough to, you know, in the marriage and the family, whatever it might be. When I am perceiving that as being communicated to me, I feel woof, like my chest tightens and I just want to, well, one of two things, either go into defensive mode and like prove all the ways <laughs> um, or kind of shut down and disengage from the conversation. So one thing that I know I've worked on in my relationship is being able to say, okay, when you, try to think, when you said you were frustrated that I didn't unload the dishwasher today, what I heard was, uh, you don't think that I'm partaking enough in this, in the daily chores or in the functioning of the house, blah, blah, blah. 99% of the time, my husband's then able to come back and say, no, I think you, you know, absolutely contribute the most. I just don't like, you know, coming home and the dishwasher is not unloaded and there's a ton of dishes. That just frustrates me. I believe you're absolutely pulling your weight in this relationship, house, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. So you can see how just asking for clarification gives the other person an opportunity to, you know, it's right in the title, but to, to clarify. Because sometimes if we have a trigger, um, no, I'm going to change the wording. We will perceive things differently through the lens of our trigger, right? So if I'm scared of not pulling my weight, right? I might be looking for, you know, oh my God, does he think that? Oh, he just said that I didn't want to use the dishwasher. Maybe he thinks that I'm not good enough. Da, da, da. So sometimes we hear things differently. Um, through our triggers. So to be able to ask for clarification, again, it can be connecting and it can be preventative in terms of leading into that negative cycle, right? So instead of me you know, reacting with defensiveness or like, well, you didn't do this and this is what I did and you didn't do this and, and then probably triggering him and then now we're in the negative cycle and it's probably not going to end well by just asking for clarification and him able to say like, uh, no, I was just frustrated about this one specific, you know, um, situation. It has nothing to do with how I feel you're contributing to the household chores or duties. Um, then it saves kind of getting trapped into that negative cycle. So as simple as this one, you know, can seem, it can be really, really powerful in terms of prevention of um, getting looped into that negative cycle with our partner. Focusing on positives. Um, I hesitated with this one because I didn't want to give the impression that, um, you know, ignore the disconnection in your relationship and ignore how you're feeling and don't be angry and just look on the bright side. So I just want to clarify that's not what this slide is about. Um, if you're feeling sad or disconnected or angry or any of those things, they're valid. Um, the reason why I added the focus on the positives is when we've been in the negative cycle in our relationships quite a bit, right? So it ebbs and flows, the negative cycle. But if we've been, if we tend to get looped up into it quite frequently in our relationships and it's intensifying and the feelings of disconnection are intensifying, what we can tend to do, and it's been proven in research, is we'll look for, right, the negatives. And I'm horrible with remembering specific stats, but I was doing some research and they were talking about, you know, when couples were feeling like they were disconnected from one another, um, it was so difficult for them to even notice one positive element of their partner or a positive interaction or to be able to acknowledge like well you know yesterday he or she did do this and that felt really good um and then you know when they did a bit of work and then they also did um, they also asked couples who um, who felt more connected and for them just naturally it was a lot easier to highlight the positives so this, again, it's not about negating the reality of your relationship. It's just to suggest, you know, taking some time to look at what is good 
about your partner, about your relationship, to help getting stuck in that, that track of only seeing what's bad or wrong or negative. Um, so some of the ways that you can focus on the positives, you can, you know, take these questions or, or sentence uh, starters and you and your partner can go and fill them out on your own. And then I encourage you to come back and share. So the qualities that initially attracted me to my partner, what I respect most about my partner, what I'm most attracted to in my partner, and my partner shows me appreciation by. And again, it's, it's an activity that can bring connection and communication and also create a bit of space um, to see what is good in the relationship. So I've worked with many couples and, you know, if the negative cycle has been present you know, for a long time and it's pretty intense, it, it is difficult for them, even though they care about one another still and they love each other and they're obviously both wonderful people, it's really difficult for them to be able to say the positives. Um, so by taking some intentional time to look at, you know, what do I respect about my partner? Um, and what do I appreciate or you know, when am I most attracted to them? It can just start again, like getting the ball rolling, um, and, and creating more connection and even just sharing. So sometimes I've had couples do this within a session and just hearing, right? Like I respect, um, what an amazing mom or father you are and how much you care for the kids. Uh, I respect, you know, your work ethic and how loyal you are. You know, watching their faces as they hear this in a session is beautiful because sometimes there's been so much disconnect that there hasn't been that opportunity to share um, what's real and authentic, but also to hear from their partner what they appreciate about one another. So again, not to negate any, you know, and shove down how you're feeling, but just to create a bit of balance. Because when we're not feeling connected in our relationships, we do have a propensity to focus on only the negatives and what's missing and what's wrong. Okay. So, I apologize. I have a couple questions um, and I know I'm past time. So if you have to go, um, please know that this will be recorded if you want to come back and listen to the questions, but I am going to take a few more minutes to um, see what questions we have. Okay. Wonderful question. Um, hope I can summarize it because it, it's a great question. It feels kind of a bit like a conversation, but it was, you know, what if we're communicating what we need to our partners and they're continuously not meeting that need? Um, you know, and to which extent do we rely on our partners to meet our needs? I don't think there's a black and white answer for that. What I can say is um, that would be deeply painful, um, and it has been when I, you know, when people have had that experience when they're saying what they need from their partner, um, and that need isn't being met. The other, um, what I've noticed when that pattern has been occurring, is sometimes. So I'll give an example. One um, wife shared to her husband, "I need, uh, I need to feel like you're my partner." because I feel alone and uh, like I'm in this all on my own. And he, he wasn't genuinely, didn't know what that would look like. Like, what, what do you mean I, I need to be more of a partner? So one of the things that we worked on was for her to be able to clarify what that meant to her. And for her, it meant, um, you know, more ongoing communication just about sometimes the daily tasks and about our emotions and, you know, about everything, just more of those, that dialogue so that I feel like we're in this together. And then she was also able to identify, you know, break it down into some concrete things that to her meant, you know, he was the partner. So 
and I, I, I'm, I'm feeling bad as I'm answering this because I know it's not as concrete as maybe you were looking for, but I, I, but I don't want to say, you know, then it's not going to work because sometimes we have to understand, you know, so why isn't that partner meeting the need? Is it that they don't truly understand the need? Is it um, like, are they feeling paralyzed and triggered in their own stuff? And that keeps them from being able to meet the need. So I would want to explore it a bit more. Um, but I, I, but it is very, very painful when someone is vulnerable enough to say, like, I need, I need you to reassure me that um, that you still love me, or I need you to comfort me. Um, it, it, it's painful uh, to not have that need continuously met. But what I might encourage is, you know, seeking out couples counseling. To, to um, just to kind of uncover and to kind of peel back the layers in terms of why that dynamic may be occurring. So I, I hope that answered it enough. Uh, and I guess what I can add to that is, you know, when I talk about communicating our emotions and asking for what we need, um, it's not so that we can be 100% dependent on our partners to meet our emotional needs. Um, you know, we can comfort ourselves, we can reassure ourselves, we can um, protect ourselves. Uh, but when it comes to creating connection um, and, and trust and, and all those sorts of things in relationships, then it is nice to be able to, in the context of the relationship, you know, to be able to say, I feel really angry when, I don't know, when you slam doors, um, when you're ticked off or when you call me names and I don't want that to happen anymore. You know, in the context of the relationship, that need is going to be important, right? I need you to respect that boundary. Um, so there are times when absolutely we can meet our own emotional needs. It just feels much more connecting um, when we can also have circumstances where we share with our partner and, and they're supporting the emotional need as well. Okay. And so the other questions were in the similar fashion, um, but I do just want to review uh, that this is being recorded. So you can follow up on the video uh, at any time if you want to go back and take the questions down or do any more self-reflection or even, you know, to bring your partner to watch it with you if they didn't have the opportunity to watch it today. And I hope that you got something out of it and look forward to presenting the next webinar if you have suggestions um, of what you'd like to see in terms of webinars it doesn't have to be couples related um, you know if you want to learn more about self-reflection and self-compassion and generating that uh, i'm absolutely open to suggestions and you can send um, messages either to uh, the Mental Health Foundations, uh, where you would have logged on, we have a, a contact email there, or you can also send emails and suggestions to myself, and my uh, personal email is Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A, Paluzzi, P-A-L-U-Z-Z-I, 888 at gmail.com. And invite you yeah, to, to, I won't promise that I'll do a webinar on every topic, but if there are things you're interested in or wanting to process or learn more about, would love to hear. Uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening and I wish you continued connection in your partnerships. Take care. <laughs>